Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Ask an Expert. Uh, Stacey Gordon answers your career questions, uh, which is part of our Get That Job webinar series here at the Champaign Public Library. My name is Jordan Neal, and I am the career librarian here at the library. So thank you all for joining us. So for the latest library news and updates, um, we invite you to visit our website, champagne.org, or you could follow us on social media. You could email us at librarian at champagne.org, or you can chat with us just by visiting the homepage of our website. Um, moving on to a couple of Zoom features available to you that might help during this webinar. There are some icons at the bottom of your Zoom screen, depending on your device. On the far left, you have the options that control your sound or your speaker. Uh, moving to the right and within the center of the window includes a chat and raised hand option. You can use these options to ask questions or share any comments. Uh, you can enter your question to the chat and ra or raise your hand and we can unmute you so you can speak and ask your question. We do have some questions prepared for our presenter. However, we do encourage you to share your questions in the chat and we'll try our best to relay them to, the, um, to Stacy. I'd also like to remind everyone that most of our webinars are recorded um, and posted to the library's YouTube channel. Finally, I I'm excited to introduce our presenter, Stacey Gordon. I invite you to read her entire bio on our website, but she is an executive advisor and diversity strategist who coaches and, and counsels executive leaders on um, DEI strategies while offering a no-nonsense approach to education. Um, her book on bias, Addressing Unconscious Bias at Work, debuted number one on Amazon's hot new release list, and it's available where, where books are sold. And it's also available here at the Champagne Pub Public Library. Uh, she's also the creator of great courses on the library's um, LinkedIn learning platform that I've, um, I've certainly enjoyed. Um, and it includes but not limited to uh, her courses on unconscious bias and writing a resume. So um, I encourage you to check those out after the webinar. Um, I'm so glad that she's joined us today. So with that, Stacy, we can go ahead and get started if that's okay with you. Sounds great. All right. So I'm just gonna jump right in here. Um, we gave everyone an opportunity to submit questions before the webinar. Um, I'm not sure if we'll get to all the questions, but we hope so. Uh, so we'll before do we, <laughs> we'll do our best. So before we get to our, our first question, I figured we would give you, Stacy, an opportunity to share more about yourself um, and your DEI related content at a Rework Work Organization. If you wanna give it a couple of minutes. Sure. Um, so. You know, you're probably wondering, well, what is a DEI person doing talking about careers? <laughs> and um, that's because that's where I started, right? I started uh, as a recruiter and spent a lot of time recruiting, working with individuals, helping them with their resumes, helping them um, with, uh, I was doing career coaching, um, and actually wrote a book uh, about interviewing, uh, an actual interview guide. And so... Um, the question here is, let's see, it says someone is, has over 10 years leading, oh, sorry, as someone who has over 10 years leading various ERGs, I'm interested in transitioning into a career in DEI and recently completed a DNI certification to bridge my experience with education. Many positions require HR experience, which I don't have. Do you have any suggestions on how to get through the initial screening if you don't check all the qualification boxes? So yes, this is it's a tough question, right? I mean, so my background is, like I said, started in recruiting did um, some career coaching and ended up in DEI because I was working as what I called a diversity recruiter. Um, and I was really finding it very difficult to get diversity uh, hired, right? Like that was my problem. And I thought, what is going on in these companies? And I realized we needed to go straight to the source. So we needed to go into the companies and have them change their hiring uh, procedures. So you do find that DEI is housed in many companies under HR, and some companies will require HR background, but it's not necessarily always needed. So I think one is you can broaden your search, especially now. Um, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but the uh, I just read a Financial Times article uh, where Johnny Taylor, who's the CEO of Sherm, was quoted and he mentioned, uh, well, the statistics in that article talked about the fact that the number of DNI positions have doubled uh, in the last couple of years. Um, you know, DNI project manager titles, obviously chief diversity officer titles, VP of diversity and inclusion titles, all of those titles 
uh, you know, there's so many positions open right now. So I think this is a really good time. Um, I do think also, uh, and this isn't just about DEI, right? I think in general, when you're trying to make a change into a different career, one of the other courses I do have on the LinkedIn learning platform is called Making a Career Change. <laughs> um, and it walks you through some of the things you need to be thinking about. Uh, and one of those things is, do you have transferable skills? So just because a company says, we want ABC requirements, doesn't mean you can't apply. It means you now have to make your skills transferable to those requirements. So you can say, okay, you're asking for somebody in HR, but what that means is you need somebody who understands maybe compliance, who you know um, understands um, how to work with people, right? Or is a people person, right? What are all the different things that an HR person traditionally would possess? And do I have those, some of those qualities? And can I show how, even though I haven't had the title of HR, I still would actually meet the qualifications. So it does require some work uh, and some, some translation, right? Um, of really saying, what, what is it that they're looking for? So that applies across the board when you're trying to make a, a change. Great. All right. So we'll go back to basics for this next question. Um, how do I start my job search? You know, this seems like, I didn't mean how do you start your job search? Like what? But this is actually a really good question because um, what a lot of people do, if you think about how do you start your job search, you think about the job that you want, right? I want to, if we use the last question as an example, I want to be a diversity and inclusion project manager, let's say. So what do you do? You go to LinkedIn, you go to Indeed, you go to, I don't know if Monster still exists, right? You go to monster.com, you go wherever. And what do you do? You type in D and I project manager and you search for that. Is that gonna get you uh, job listings? Yes. Um, but is it going to get you all the jobs that you could potentially apply to? No. So we have to stop searching by job title and really think about what is it that you want to do. And then when you think about what it is that you want to do, you can start to then see, well, make a list of what are some of the things you would do in that job and then start searching for those things, right? Search for skills and abilities, not for job titles. You can also go on to LinkedIn. Um, I use LinkedIn for you know, recon, right? Go and search for people who have the job titles that you think you want. Go and read what they've written about what, what experience and what skills they have. And then you can use those, um, those bullet points as search terms and find other jobs that maybe also require that same type of, of skill set. So, it helps you to broaden the range of jobs that you're looking for and still be within the, the same sort of function that you want. Great. How and where do I address um, employment gaps? So that's a tough one, right? In addressing employment gaps. I think that, um, Again, this is also part of where are you applying? Some companies are very strict about employment gaps. We don't want to see them. And other companies have a little bit more leeway. So I do think that um, it might take you a little bit longer to find the right position. Um, but I think that when you have an employment gap, depending upon what that gap is for, you know, there are creative ways that you can fill the gap and also depending on how long the gap is, right? You know, if it's six months or a year or three years, or I mean, it, it's a big difference, right? So if your gap was because you took off five years to decide to be a stay-at-home mom, um, you might actually put that in there, right? I've seen people will say, um, actually put a, a section in their resume that states some of the things that they were doing. Um, if you don't want to identify what you were doing in that time off, I think one of the things you can do is fill that gap on the resume with activities, right? So professional development activities, things that you were doing in that time, maybe you still were volunteering. Um, those are things that you can also put, you don't have to put volunteer activities just at the bottom of your resume as a, as an add-on, you know, if you were really, um, you know, participating on a board or, 
um, raising money for a charity or anything like that, you can put it in as a position on your resume to help to fill in some of those gaps. Um, and sometimes you just, you're gonna have a gap, right? And, and that is what it is um, and it's okay. And I think that yes, it might take a little bit longer but a company that is gonna hire you with a gap is better than a company that is going to hire you with hiding a gap, right? All right. And feel free to type questions into the chat if you have any, but we'll move on to the next one. Um, I'm creating my first resume. Is there anything I should include or avoid? So I'm going to assume if you're creating your first resume, I'm making some assumptions here, right? But I'm assuming if you're making your first resume that you're probably young, probably don't have a lot of experience yet. Um, and, you know, for individuals who, you know, sometimes I get this question from people who are still in college and they're like, well, how do I put my high school on my resume? Is that something that I should do? Um, and like, you know what, if that's what you've got, then yes, put it on there right now. Is that going to immediately um, tell somebody about your age? Of course it is, right? Because also your lack of experience is going to tell them how old you are. Um, so again, these are qualities that it's not that you have to hide them. It's that you, you need to build on what you've got. So if you're creating your first resume and you've only got one job to put on that resume, then you make it better make it darn good, right? Um, think about what are some of the things that you've done? What are um, ways that you made a difference in that job? And you might say, well, I was a cashier at McDonald's. W what, what does that matter? Well, okay, you were a cashier at McDonald's, which means that you were trusted to handle uh, tens of thousands of dollars, right? On a daily basis. That's something I would write on my resume that I was trusted to, um, you know, maybe be the team lead or the shift supervisor, or even if I wasn't the shift supervisor, I was the person who would act as the shift supervisor when my shift supervisor would disappear. Cause that happens a lot in retail, right? All of a sudden you're like, where are all the managers? There is nobody here who's a manager, right? So being able to um, just show how, like what type of work that you have done and just putting it in a light that lets people know that you're responsible, that you are trustworthy, that you show up on time, that you do what you say you're gonna do, that you're dependable, um, that you, you know, even if you make a mistake, you find it, you correct it, right? Um, it's not always about not, all, not making mistakes, it's about admitting you made mistakes and being able to correct them. So taking some time to really uh, put that into bullet points and show the experience that you have and test it, right? With some, some other people, some older folks who've got maybe a little bit more experience, ask them, how do I take this skill and make it sound really good? What can I do? All right. Is it true that I should use similar phrases and words from the job description in my resume or my cover letter? Yes, it is. Because, um, you know, uh, until I work myself out of a job, we're talking about unconscious bias, um, people always will gravitate towards things that, that is similar to them, that they understand, that they know and like. And so if you can demonstrate in your resume that you already understand their lingo, that's going to subconsciously, it literally puts you above other people, right? Because you're already speaking their language, so to speak. Um, so it really is important. Um, of course, when you do that, right, now you've customized that resume. So now you have to make sure that you're not then using that same resume and cover letter for somebody else, because now you've customized and put in all of these keywords that speak directly to this one company. You don't necessarily want to turn around and use that same thing for a competitor. Yes, very great point. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, I had that happen actually um, at a, a job fair. I was standing at, <laughs> uh, you know, you do the career fairs, right? And so somebody walked up to me and handed me a resume and then they snatched it back and said, oh, sorry, took out a pen, crossed out the name of another company, wrote in the name of the company that I was recruiting for and then handed it back to me. Wow. And I was like, Okay, you realize that is not going to fly. <laughs> Maybe avoid doing that. <laughs> um, I am going to 
instead of this question, someone did write something into the chat. So I'm going to read off their question if that's okay. Sure. Um, I'm in the process of applying for jobs, but I've been getting few responses. Is it appropriate to follow up with a company via LinkedIn and asking to be pointed to the best point of contact within the company for a status update or my application? Yes and no. So yes to the first part of what you said, right? Is it appropriate to follow up with the company via LinkedIn? Yes. Don't ask to be pointed to the best point of contact within the company, right? Research and figure that out yourself. So you need to use LinkedIn and figure out who do I need to get in touch with. Um, you, you know, if you're applying in the, for in a position in the marketing department, let's say, okay, go find out who is the head of marketing for the company that you are applying to, even if it's not the person, you know, even if that the head of department, excuse me, even if the head of the department isn't the one who's going to be recruiting for that position, eventually they're probably going to have something to say about it, right? So um, you want to reach out to that person, you wanna reach out. It also, that's the nice thing about LinkedIn is you can see sometimes through um, how people are connected, you can see who their direct reports might be and that might help you find you know, the team lead or the project lead or the recruiter specifically that handles you know, marketing. So finding all of those people, there is nothing wrong with sending them all a message and saying, I am really excited about working here. I want to work for XYZ company and I've applied my resume is sitting in your um, ATS system, and I'm really hoping that you will take a moment to look at it because I would love to come in for an interview. Please let me know when, um, you know, if you've had a chance to review my resume, here it is attached, right? Send it to them. Um, that does work. Um, uh, it actually worked for me. I've done it a few times, right? Um, because Sometimes they just, they don't see it. I actually had, so this was a while back, right? When I worked at Mattel, I got a job at Mattel because I had submitted my resume, I don't know how many times through their online portal, never heard back. And I was like, I wanna work at Mattel. And I found out who the head of the department was and I faxed them. Yes, I faxed it. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a story about that in a minute too. But I faxed it to them. I fax it directly to the person. You know what happens when you fax things? It goes to the person. They pick it up and look at it. She took my resume, walked over to HR and said, why haven't you interviewed this person? They haven't shown up on my desk. They look in the ATS system and find my name. And they were like, oh, well, we don't know, right? Head of the department was pretty upset that they hadn't interviewed me. Now, you might all be laughing when I say fax machine, especially if you're young. But let me tell you this. Law firms, insurance companies, uh, especially insurance companies um, and any company that uh, banks, right? Many of them still have fax machines. So they, they'll be hard to find at this point to find their fax number. But if you can find their fax number and you send in a cover letter and a resume and you, you address it to the person that you need it to get to, you have probably a 85% chance of that resume landing on their desk for them to pick it up and look at it. Oh, interesting. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, well, thank you for your question. And they did relay their thanks. They said, thanks so much. This helps tremendously. Um, so we'll move on to the next question. What are overused or outdated items and or approaches you see on resumes and cover letters? Um, you know, the outdated and the overused, I would say, is using some of those buzzwords, right? Like, you know, I'm hardworking and I'm diligent. It's like, we would sure hope so. <laughs> Detail oriented. Um, <laughs> right. Detail oriented. Again, we really hope so. <laughs> um, and so you know, just have to get a little creative um, in using some of the words, you know, kind of like what I said earlier is you don't necessarily want to say, you know, I'm a hard worker, but you want to say, I was responsible for managing X, right? I was um, uh, in charge of these different um, functions, right? I was the, the liaison to three different departments that handled 500 pieces of correspondence every day, right? Just whatever it is, any, anything that you can take and make it tangible and make it um, numbers driven and use data is always going to sound better than just saying, I worked really hard or I handled a lot of mail. 
<laughs> Great. So what are your thoughts on resume reviewing software or services like JobScan? So I think, um, you know, you're always going to get in what you, what's the word I'm saying? You're going to get out of it what you put into it, right? So with a lot of resume reviewing software and things like that, I mean, you have to know what it is that you are trying to achieve. Um, it, it really, I think, is important. It goes back to the earlier question about customization and about understanding what are the keywords, what are the things that the company is going to care about. Because if the software reviews your web, your resume, right, it's gonna be reviewed for one specific job. It's kind of like when people would come to me and say, I need you to help me um, to write a new resume. And I would say, well, why are you coming to me? Well, I went to this other resume writer and I really, I paid all this money and I don't think this resume worked. And so now I'm, I'm coming to you. Okay, well, the reason that resume didn't help you and you spent hundreds of dollars on a resume writer is because you weren't targeted in your approach. You can't look at these things in a, in a vacuum and think a general approach is going to do it for you. That's the thing that really sucks about job hunting. So you cannot take a general approach. You really do have to take a streamlined and targeted and focused approach and say, um, you know, the advice I used to always give was say, look, Start with five, five companies that you absolutely would give your right arm to work for, right? And then target the heck out of them. Make sure your cover letter is targeted. Make sure you have looked up contacts and you know who you need to send a resume to. I'm finding fax numbers. I'm finding email addresses. I'm finding snail mail addresses. And I am mailing, faxing, emailing, calling because I want to work at this company. If you do that for five companies, it's going to take you weeks. <laughs> you can't do it for every company. And it's the other reason that you really just doing this sort of, uh, you know, apply and pray uh, process isn't going to, it doesn't work for you either, right? Because you're just sort of blanketing the world with your resume and we need to save trees. So <laughs> that's not going to work for you. Um, you need to like take five target and make it happen and then take another five and target them and then another five right and if you do that with maybe 20 companies overall you should should get a much better response than if you were to just sit and blindly apply to like 100 positions all right Applicant tracking systems, what are they and how can my application um, or my resume get through these systems? So they can't, right? <laughs> I mean, that's not necessarily true, right? I, I'm being a little, little funny. Um, <laughs> applicant tracking systems, right, are kind of what I was talking about when I was applying at, at, at Mattel. Depending upon who built that system, and what they put in for keywords, right? So if I'm the hiring manager, and again, I say I'm looking to hire a cashier um, who has experience and who has worked at McDonald's, I have to put in those keywords, right? So the keywords that I put in might not be the keywords that you think of when you get ready to write your resume. So that's why when you apply, you don't pop up for me because we use different keywords. So this is why the, the applicant tracking system, it's not that great because unless you can be in the mind of the hiring manager and know exactly what they're looking for and what keywords they put in there, you, it's hit or miss a lot of times. Um, so this is why it really is important that yes, apply, because I will never ever forget, and this was years ago, I can't remember her name, but it was uh, like, um, like the VP of HR for a company. And she said, I am never ever gonna hire somebody who has not applied and put their information into my applicant tracking system. Because if I tell you that that's the way to apply to my company and you don't do it, why on earth would I hire you and think that you're gonna follow instructions later? And I was like, good point. So even though you know your applicant tracking system sucks, <laughs> you still want people to use it, right? And that's their right, because they're the company, right? So we have to go by the rules. The rules say apply. So do it. And this is why, as I said earlier, 
do it and then say, I have applied. My resume, my cover letter, my information is in your system. I applied on XYD, XYZ date at XYZ time for XYZ position. This is the position that I am applying to. And I'm reaching out to you because you work in that department. Now, you may not be the person that needs to receive my resume, but you might know who. And if you could pass it along, that's great. Uh, if you are the person, awesome. I would love to talk to you, right? Make it personable and make them want to talk to you. Tell them why you want to work for the company. So getting, it's not really about getting through the system. If you can get, there are people, I know people who say, oh, I just apply and I just get jobs. It just works. I know way more people who say they hate the applicant tracking systems and they never hear anything back. So it is sometimes just luck of the draw. I, and I, I also will say that, Again, it goes back to that question earlier about customization and about putting in words. It will usually be helpful if you look at the wording in the job description and mirror back some of those in the resume that you submit, because then you probably do have a higher likelihood of your resume getting picked up uh, for that particular position. All right. It's a question we get a lot here at the library. Should I always include a cover letter? So I hate cover letters. <laughs> I hate them so much. Um, and I honestly, I can't with any certainty tell you that people read them. However, it goes back to if there's a rule that they want a cover letter, then you better for sure write one, <laughs> right? Because really a lot of it is just looking to see, did you follow instructions? If I said I wanted a cover letter and a resume, I'll be honest, if I say I want a cover letter and a resume, I will read the cover letter. Now, will I read the whole thing if it's long? No, um, I will skim it. And so cover letters should really be short. They should in, um, they should give information that you can't really get through in a resume um, and really give more sort of color, right, to your resume. So if you're submitting a cover letter, you want it to say, one, why you want to work at this specific company, right, what it is about that company. So this is the, you know, ego stroke that they want, right? What is so great about my company that you want to apply there. Tell me that you did your research, that you have looked us up, that you actually know what it is that we do. I can't tell you the amount of times I have looked at, res at cover letters and been like, do they know what we do here? <laughs> like, what is this? Right. So don't copy and paste. Um, and this is why I say when you do the a targeted approach, you need to write a really good cover letter. But this is why it does take longer because you're writing a really good cover letter, you're creating a customized um, resume, you're finding all these contacts, you're doing all this follow-up, there's a lot that goes into it. So I will just say that in the cover letter, you want to make sure you have said why you want to work there, you want to make it clear you understand what they do, and then you want to tell them what you're going to bring to the table, what value why should they hire you, right, uh, as opposed to somebody else? What is it that you're going to do that is so special that makes you the person that they should want to hire? Tell them those three things, and you should be able to do that in three very short paragraphs or one sort of big paragraph, but keep it succinct. Not a 10-page report. All right. Any suggestions for negotiating salary or any other benefits? So negotiation has never really been my forte, but the place that I will say with negotiating salary is it's always hard to get information from the company, right, about what's the, the most that they're willing to pay. And even if you do know it, a lot of times you don't want to ask for it because then they think, oh, you want too much. So then you go in in the middle and you're like, well, if I go in the middle, that should be fine. And then they end up offering you less than what you actually asked for. So you're just in this the space where you don't know what to do. I think that a good way to go into it is to go with, you know, do your research, know what the industry standards are, and also for your region, right? So not just industry standard for California, and I work in, you know, Idaho. Um, I will say also another, from a 
DEI standpoint, so I put on my DEI hat for a minute, I'm always telling companies that who cares where the person works, look at what the value is of the job, right? If this is what a job is worth, then pay it and stop trying to change it up or down based upon whether it's a man or a woman or how much they're willing to, to accept. Like that's not a good way to do it. So it doesn't help you though, because I say from, the, from your perspective, you need to go in with, this is what I know the market rate is um, and I'd like to be close to market, right? That's an easy way to do it because they can't dispute market numbers. And if you say you'd like to be close to market, what does close mean, right? So let them give you a number. Um, if you get a number that is not what you were expecting, but that it's okay for you, right? It's acceptable and you could do it, but you wanna get to an another number, that's where you can then say, okay, thank you so much for your offer of you know $40,000 or $45,000, whatever it is. Um, but I really was hoping to be at this level. So is there an opportunity that six months from now, if I accept at this rate, that we can reevaluate my um, pay if I meet all of our objectives, right? And then of course you have to make sure they give you objectives because that's the other part. A lot of times they don't give you objectives. You need to ask what those are. <laughs> Great. Uh, should I join LinkedIn? If so, how often should I be updating my profile? Yes, I think you should join LinkedIn. Um, and I'm sort of biased because obviously I, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, but also just, I mean, I've been using it since 2005. And I was an early adopter. I love LinkedIn because it allows you, there's so many ways you can use it. Um, and so I think that the other thing is that people will look you up when you're not on LinkedIn. There really is this sort of like, huh? Well, how are you not on LinkedIn? That's weird, right? So then you, then if people start digging more, like today I was actually looking for somebody that I met at a conference because um, I'm actually in a hotel room right now. I'm, I'm in Houston. And I was searching for her on LinkedIn and she didn't come up. And I was like, well, that's weird. So then I went to Google her because I was like, all right, now I'm going to Google her, right? If you're on LinkedIn, people aren't going to Google you. You don't want people Googling you. You don't know what's going to pop up. <laughs> Most times if somebody <laughs> looks you up and you're on LinkedIn, they will stop right there. <laughs> but if you're not on LinkedIn, they might go further. And if you've never Googled yourself, please do that. Please search the internet and see what pops up when your name is put into a search bar um, and really get an idea of what is out there. I had a, a candidate um, that she was ready. We were about to get her her dream job. And um, the day before they were about to give us the offer, uh, the company called me and said, so have you Googled your candidate? And I was like, oh. What does she do? So I was like, no, I haven't Googled her. What is it? And they basically found like boudoir photos of her on the internet, right? Um, now, was it a big deal? Not really, she was kind of covered up, but the idea was that she was going into a PR role and people would probably be Googling her a lot. And she's gonna be doing a lot of things that were out on the internet and they were like, eh, we just, we can't. And she didn't get the job. So it might not matter for the kind of job you're getting, but one, you should know what's out there about you. You should never be surprised. And two, if there are things that are out there that you really need to manage, you might as well get the jump on that now. Yes, thank you. Yes, we encourage people here at the library. We, we call it performing an online audit <laughs> and looking at all that information. Um, are there any other networking websites or resource, resources I should look into? Oh, man. I mean, there's tons, right? It just depends on what industry you're in. I always say look for industry associations and industry networking groups that will relate to whatever industry you're in. I mean, there's probably like if you're, I sometimes I come across people and I'm like, there's an association for that? Like I met somebody, it was like the elevators, it was like the association of women in elevator mechanics or something. I was like, really? <laughs> so there are tons of, um, you know, networking opportunities out there. And especially right now, because everything is still so online, um, there's a lot of opportunities to get into some other types of networks that maybe you might not have before because you weren't local. 
Um, and this is a great opportunity to kind of expand out and see what's out there. All right. What are your thoughts on having your image or any other images on your resume? No, don't do it. <laughs> um, I mean, so in I think in creative spaces, right, you can get a little more funky with your resume. Um, but I think that's only if you're handing somebody your resume in person. Um, again, we go back to the ATS systems. If you're trying to submit something online, a resume that is not formatted in the normal way and has a bunch of boxes and colors and different things is not going to get read properly. And it's going to end up a jumbled mess on the other side for that person and your resume will not get looked at. So um, I wouldn't suggest it. There isn't any need to put your picture on your resume since again, you're probably on LinkedIn and if somebody really wants to know what, they, what you look like, they can look you up on LinkedIn. Um, and plus you want the space usually on your resume. Who's got time to put putting in other things? Like you need that space to cram in all the great things that you've done. Um, so I probably wouldn't take it up with uh, creative over the top things that really are extraneous and not necessary. Thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on informational interviews? I love informational interviews. Um, I think that informational interviews are so helpful. They are necessary. Um, I think that when you have, um, especially when you're trying to do a career change, um, an informational interview is going to be your friend because you have the opportunity to talk to somebody in the field. And that's where, again, I go back to LinkedIn. You can find people who are maybe doing the job you're already, that you want. And you can send them a message and say, hey, I'm really interested in this field or this function or this role. Um, would you be open to spending 15 minutes with me on the phone? Um, letting, you know, I, I'd like to ask you three questions. So that's the other thing. Be specific when you ask people for their time. Um, do not send them a message that says, hi, I love your profile, can we chat? <laughs> what does that mean? I, I get those kind of messages all the time. And I'm like, I don't have time to figure out what it is that you want. I need you to tell me very specifically what you want so I can say yes or no, because we're all really busy. So if you want an informational interview, tell the person what you want, why you want it, what you expect from them, how much time it's going to take, right? If you start with, I have three questions for you about the industry that you're in and how you got started, or I have three questions about the company that you work for and what it might take um, for someone with my background to get into that industry, or I have, three, like, I'm specifically saying three questions because might you have more than three questions? Yes. But if you tell somebody it's three questions and I just need 15 minutes, they're much more likely to say yes to that than can I have an hour of your time so we can chat over coffee? Okay. You probably won't even get a response to that. Great. All right. Um, what are your suggestions on how I can approach an informational interview? I think you mentioned some already. Yeah, and I think, I mean, really, it's being specific, it's being intentional about it, and it's also not um, not getting discouraged if you don't get a response, right? Because the other thing I realized is not everybody is on LinkedIn all the time. So going back to the other question, which I didn't answer the other part of, is how often should I update my LinkedIn profile? Sometimes, yeah, people put their LinkedIn profile out there. They're not on it every day like I am. I'm on it three, four times a day sometimes because I'm just constantly responding to people, talking to people, I'm posting things, I'm in my messages, there's things happening. But for a lot of people, they have no reason to be on LinkedIn more than once a month. So if you send them a message and they don't respond, it doesn't mean that they hate you and they don't wanna to talk to you. It just means that they don't check their messages. And by the time they do, they now have a hundred messages and they might respond to a few of them, but nobody's really doing it like it's a job, right? So don't get discouraged if you don't get responses. Don't give up. It means you need to reach out to more people. Again, be specific to make it easier to get a response. Um, and don't take it personal. All right. Uh, if I learned about a position in an ad or through a friend, should I mention it? I mean, I guess so, right? Um, depending upon who the friend is, right? 
<laughs> it's like, can you find out if that person hates your friend first? <laughs> right. <laughs> what is the relationship here? <laughs> right. You might want to ask your friends, like, so do you know, how well do you know this person? Do they like you? Did you do anything to one of their children? <laughs> But yeah, people usually like to know where you heard about a job. So, I mean, and a lot of times they will ask. Okay, great. How can I become a pro at networking? Do it. Um, do it, do it, do it, right? I think a lot of us are really scared of going out and networking. Um, the networking tips I used to always give was that if you, if you hate networking and you really are kind of a shy, introverted person and you just don't want to stand around making small talk and the thought of doing that makes you want to just run screaming, there's some things you can do, right? One of them is show up early. So I know that makes you seem like the geek or the nerd or whatever who's like showing up to th this event and you're the first person in the door. But do it because what it allows you to do is one, at least so for me, right? I, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I hated driving, hated driving so much. It would make me really nervous. And so I would have to get there really early so I could find a good parking spot. So I could make sure I knew where I was going because I was probably going to get lost and it would take me an extra half hour to get there. And then, I, and then that way I'm not arriving sweaty and flustered and pissed off, right? <laughs> so go early, stake out your spot in the room it then allows you to be the person who can welcome people in because when people come into the room and you're one of only two people there, guess what? They're going to come over and say hi to you. It means you don't have to go up to them and say hello. They're going to come to you. It's make it a little bit easier. You're not walking into a crowded room trying to now interrupt conversations that are already in process. Yes, that has happened many times and you get to relax <laughs> on top of it. So yeah, you get to get a drink first too. And exactly. You get the best food before everybody else shows up. Um, when I'm asked about strengths and weaknesses in an interview, what is the employer hoping to learn? You know, it depends. Some people, they're, they're just wanting to see how well you can answer a question without being flustered. They don't actually care about the answer because they know the answer to this question isn't going to be that, well, my strengths are that um, I'm a rock star at everything and my weaknesses are that I'm late to work and I'm, I'm not detail oriented and you have to ask me three times to get stuff done, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's not what you're gonna say. So they already know there are going to be canned answers to this. I think they're usually looking for some creativity with it to see, well, you know, how true and, and, and you know, have you really thought about this and how does it relate um, and also, how confident are you in your ability to answer this question? If you're one of these people that kind of stutters over it, like this is like, I feel like we were asking this question back when Moses, you know, <laughs> was around. <laughs> so at this point, if you can't answer this question without stumbling over it, that's going to be a red flag. Because if there's any question on the planet, you should be able to answer without any problem. It's this one. Okay, we do have a question in the chat. Um, I think you touched on a little bit earlier, but um, what's your take on cold calling on LinkedIn? Any best practices? Um, I mean, if you're talking about cold calling for, um, you know, just sort of cold calling in terms of maybe following up on a resume, um, I don't, I think it's a good thing to do, right? You, but you just have to be really specific about it. And again, if you're one of those people who, um, you don't necessarily want to talk to the person because you're like, oh, I don't know what I want to say. I just want them to look at my resume. Um, or the other thing is a lot of times you can't get to the person because they've got a gatekeeper, right? There's an assistant or somebody who was like, well, what do you want? Why are you getting through? Do you have an appointment? No, I can't help you click, right? They want to hang up on you. So my tip has always been to leave a message later in the evening. Don't do it at nine o'clock because it makes you look cre creepy, but maybe like 7, 7.30 their time, right? It's just after hours to where they probably won't be picking up the phone or their assistant won't be picking up the phone and you should get voicemail. And then write out specifically what you're going to say so you don't mess it up because <laughs> you don't want to be one of those people that's like, hi, this is Stacy, and I was calling about, I mean, I had a, um, oh shoot, right? <laughs> <laughs> Start rambling. <laughs> right. Be very specific. Make it short. Write it out. Get it so you know exactly what you want to say. Then make the phone call and leave the message. It's basically, hi, this is Stacy Gordon. I sent in a resume 
for the job of retail supervisor. I'm really interested in working for your company and I'm hoping that you would take a minute to look at my resume. Again, it's Stacy Gordon and my resume is in your ATS system. But if you have questions, you can call me at 310 blah, 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 right? Do that. Now, one thing is if you do that, do be prepared for someone to actually pick up the phone. Because <laughs> I did have that happen one time. I wasn't expecting anyone and they picked up and I was like, uh. <laughs> yes, that's happened to me as well. Um, they, they relay their thanks. Um, if I'm really interested in a particular position or company, will following, you, I think you touched on this as well, uh, will following up with an HR rep at that company after submitting an application benefit or hurt me? I would imagine that doing so would help me stand out from the crowd. Yes, it will. It will only hurt you if you're rude, right? If you follow up in ways that are, follow up too much and you're annoying. Um, and, you know, but I think if you do the follow up and say, again, I've applied to this position, I haven't heard back in, X number of weeks, was just wondering if the position was still open, they'll probably get back to you with a canned, right? That's a, something that says, we will let all applicants know if we have an interest in reaching out to them, right? That's the, the, the worst that you'll get. But the best thing you'll get is somebody might say, oh yeah, I actually meant to look at that resume. Let me go look at it. And you might get a call back. All right, we're moving right along. Um, what are questions to ask interviewers to get a feel for the company? Hmm. So, I mean, I think now, right, some of the questions are, um, you want to know, like, am I going to get an opportunity to speak with others who might be on my team before I start the job, right, or before I accept a job or before, like, as part of the process, is that something that we're going to be able to do? Because getting an opportunity to speak to other people and not just this one person um, is going to be really helpful. Um, asking whether this is a newly created position or if somebody, if you're replacing somebody, uh, because sometimes if it's newly creative, that might mean that they are expanding and there's more opportunity. If they're replaced, if you're replacing somebody, you, you know, they probably won't tell you, but you can still ask why, <laughs> right? Why did the person leave, right? Are they moving on to a new opportunity, um, right? And just again, it kind of like in, in the question of what are your strengths and weaknesses? Your reason for asking that question is to see what their reaction is when you ask, why is the person leaving? Because some people, right, they'll go, oh, right? And they, they, they're upset with that person, right? Or they have something to say about them that might be negative. Or sometimes it's just, oh, they've got a better opportunity and they've moved on to a competitor. Or it might be that actually they got promoted within the company and they've moved into a different role, right? It just helps you to get an idea of what does that look like? What does the career trajectory look like? Um, and if they ask, like, why are you asking? That's what you can say. I'm just interested to learn a little bit more about career trajectory in the company. Um, you can also ask if they say, you know, that yes, it's a, you're replacing somebody. Question that would be good to ask, how long was that person in the role, right? Because it would be really nice to know whether they're six months or six years. <laughs> they was there six years? you might want to think of a few more questions to probe a little bit, right, about the company, because um, that, that that tells you something, right? Um, and you can even ask, like, six months, oh, that was kind of a, a short amount of time. Was this role not a fit for them, right? You can ask, well, what about this role might you say is the most challenging? Um, what is the thing that people find to be the most challenging in it? What is the thing that people find to be the most fun about this position? Um, going to help you to really get a sense of um, what it's like working for the company. You can even ask the interviewer, how long have you worked for the company, right? What brought you to the company? What do you like most about working for the company? What are the things that make you happy about working for the company? If you could change something in the company, what would that one thing be, right? You need to interview them because they're not going to be ready for that question. And a lot of times you get some really honest answers. <laughs> Oh, great. We have a few more questions here. What are some tips on following up after the interview? So I think all the stuff I said before about definitely, I would still do the same thing for following up on a resume. You can do the same follow up on LinkedIn. But with the difference, if this is an interview, you want to ask them, when should I expect to hear from you? Right? Because let them give you a time frame. If they say it's, they expect to uh, get back to you in two weeks, and you start following up in two days, now you're being annoying. <laughs> so 
find out from them. When should I expect to hear from you? Is it okay if I reach out within two weeks if I don't hear from you, right? Then they might say, uh, you know what? Give me three weeks. Find out what that follow-up process should be um, so that you you don't fall into that category of getting on someone's nerves inadvertently. And I, I think you, in sending the thank you, how, how what's the turnaround time on that you suggest? I would say do that immediately. I used to always have a thank you and I still, I mean, it's been a long time since I've had to interview, but um, I would have the thank you cards. I was one of those people that would write out um, or I, I would script out what I wanted to, what I thought I was going to say. And I would have it written on a piece of paper in my car. I would have the thank you notes. I would have the address of the company already on the envelopes. And then I'd make sure I got the names of the people that I interviewed with. When I got to my car, I would look at a couple of the different scripts I had written out and go, well, which one of these makes the most sense? This one does. Okay, I can tweak this slightly and I can do a quick write up and I can send it. And that way I'm not trying to now think after the interview, what do I say? I don't know what to say. And you know, you've just had an interview, you're feeling kind of, you know, nervous and you just need to get it out. So I would have a stamp ready and I would go straight to a mailbox and drop it in the mail before I even made it back home after the interview. <laughs> so we all know that not getting the job is the reality for, for a lot of people. Is it appropriate to ask why you were not granted the position? Absolutely. Are you going to get an answer? Probably not. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, it's one of the things I think other than cover letters that I hate the most about job hunting is that you're not going to get an answer and you're not going to get an answer for a number of reasons. Some of it is CYA, right? They don't want to give you a reason because then you could take that reason and turn it around and say that they were discriminating against you. That's what I've heard a lot from HR. Um, and I do believe that HubSpot um, actually has started giving people real reasons that they don't get the job, which I was like, applause, applause, applause. That is awesome because how are people supposed to know what the problem is if you don't tell them? They're just going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's doing such a disservice to the whole job search process if we don't give people feedback. So I'm really hoping that um, we're swinging back around to giving feedback because this whole idea of not giving feedback, I think is really stupid. <laughs> Appreciate your honesty. Uh, what are my next steps after I receive a job offer? After you receive a job offer, I mean, it's like, is it your only one, right? Because then it's like, am I comparing to others? Am I still waiting for uh, another company to get back to me? Um, if you're waiting and hoping that there's another offer out there, you want to let this company know, you know, when do I need to get back to you on this by, right? Um, they usually will try to push you and like, well, we'd love an answer tomorrow. Um, so finding out when do, when do you need to respond to that job offer is the first question you need to ask if it's not in the letter already. Um, and then if there are other job offers that you are expecting or hoping for, you know, you could reach out then to those other companies and say, um, I was really hoping to have heard from you by now. I've actually received another job offer and I'm evaluating my options. I would love to be able to include you um, in that process and wondering if I could hear from you within the next day or so um, with an update on my candidacy. And then at that point, you've got to, you know, got to make your decisions. All right. What are resources that you use, Stacey, for your own professional development? Um, you know, it, it, this is... I don't say it's bad, but honestly, um, because I'm so busy, I wake up on Saturday mornings, I take out my phone, and I start scrolling through social media. And the reason I do that, though, is I have a lot of friends who are smarter than me, um, and they post really great things, awesome articles. And so I end up spending a lot of time reading Harvard Business Review, case studies, news articles, different things that other people have posted. And it kind of helps keep me in the, in the know as to what people are talking about and what's going on. So I do do that. 
Um, I try to read. I have a stack of books that I have not really caught up with. Um, I'm actually reading a book called Surrounded by Idiots right now. <laughs> um, I'm also reading, um, I was trying to read Daniel Kahneman's Fast and Slow, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, which is about system one, system two thinking and unconscious bias. Um, I also bought Cast because uh, I had fully intended to dive into that. I have not cracked it open yet, um, but it's it's on the list. <laughs> so there's a, there's a laundry list of, of books. Um, and then I do look at some of the courses in the LinkedIn Learning Library as well. All right. Well, that's all we have for questions that um, we had ahead of time. If you have any further questions, we have a few more minutes if you want to type them into the chat or raise your hand and you can speak. Um, First off, thank you, Stacy, for your time. We appreciate it. We appreciate all of your, your insights that you shared with us tonight. Um, and again, we can open it up in the chat. And thank you all for attending uh, the webinar. Um, I don't see, oh, I thought somebody was typing something here. Anyway, so our next career webinar will be Embracing Career Changes uh, with local career coach Kevin Martledge, and he will join us to discuss how to successfully consider and change your career as you focus on your professional pursuits, and that will be on Tuesday, November 2nd at 10 a.m. Oh, you're getting some thank yous in the chat, Stacey. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> And I'll just do a reminder too that yes. you know the LinkedIn Learning, um, you know the, the resume course is helpful. It's like two and a half hours. It literally walks you through everything you need to do in a resume. Um, so there's a ton of information in that course. And then there's also the one on career change. Um, <laughs> so if you go to this one and you get some great information here, and then you can follow it up with um, you know putting in the work and walking through what you need to do uh, to make those changes because I think it, it really it does take work to to change careers. Definitely. Yeah, I was we were going to I was going to mention it. I've taken, uh, I think, most probably all your courses <laughs> on LinkedIn learning. And what's also great is they're really great supplemental material that you've included in those courses. So, um, yes, I encourage everyone to check those out. Uh, we do subscribe to LinkedIn learning here at the library. That's great. That's right. You're one of the libraries that allows that people can log in and they get access to LinkedIn learning. So I think that's so awesome that they can have access to that. Um, and I guess I'll do one other, other plug. I know I mentioned the book um, that I wrote on interview guides. Um, I, I had self-published it. And so it's no longer available on Amazon. But what I did is I took it and I took all the material and I've made it available for free. Wow. Um, and so it is available on my website. If you go to learn.reworkwork.com, you can actually sign in and get access to a career toolkit that has that. It's got all kinds of other tools and things that are free. Um, for you to be able to use. So wonderful. Thank you, Stacy. Um, yeah, we hope you and we have a lot of the links on our website too. So we have Stacy's rework work um, link there and we have a link to the book that we own. Um, so yeah, check that out, please, after the webinar. Um, and yeah, we hope you consider attending more webinars um, and workshops. Um, I have the career November series listed here, but we have more webinars coming up related to our business series, our technology series, our crafty adults, our writers workshops. We're starting a new um legal aid series coming up. So please visit our website, champagne.org slash events uh, to sign up for those workshops. Um, you could also sign up to receive the latest um, library news and updates by subscribing to our newsletter uh, by visiting champagne.org slash news. Wonderful. And once again, here is our contact information if you wanted to follow up. And uh, you can email librarian at champagne.org and it will get to me one way or the other. And that's all we have here. Thank you again, Stacy, for your time. I wrote down a lot of notes <laughs> throughout the presentation. Um, I don't see any further questions. So if it's okay with you, Stacy, I think we can go ahead and end our webinar. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Everyone have a great night. Bye-bye.